So they have the most basic rudimentary of weapons. These are 16 gauge shotguns. If you can see, this is very badly rusted. The brake action is uh, fabricated. I'm not even sure how well these will fire. I mean, they'll fire. They have one shot and it's gonna take some time to reload. This barrel is filled with debris. These weapons are not very well maintained or taken care of. And uh, for anyone coming here to hurt these people, this is the perfect people. They have almost no defense. You might as well throw rocks. I know. This is filled with dirt. Rekka, the American Vindicta show. Awesome show, by the way. Um, yeah. it's glad to have you back, mate. Hey, guys. Good to be back. Hola. <laughs> it's, uh, it is surreal to be back on the show, considering the fact that we you know, literally talked last time, went to Peru mm -hmm. and are back. And Yeah. So what do you guys want to know? Everything with sugar on top. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, I assume you guys have watched the uh, the debrief that Timothy Albrino and I mm -hmm. did. Yes. You know, the yeah. to get into the more intricate part of that, go ahead, man. I was just going to have you recovered from the uh, the drink you drank. The uh, it looked delicious. Oh, it was disgusting. How did it, it smell? Was, uh, it was horrible. Um, I would say that if you took if you took buttercream milk. And you let it sit outside on a warm day and you put like coconut shavings in it that's what it mm -hmm. tasted like it was disgusting mm -hmm. i don't know how tim just drank it he's oh man it's the best masada i've ever had and then i was throwing it up in my mouth and he's like trust me that's good masado you don't want to have bad masado like i don't want to have masado <laughs> at all <laughs> it was horrible i don't know how those people do it yeah, for everyone watching, um, now that that if I remember correctly, that's on uh, Tim's channel, right? Timothy Alberino, the full yeah. debrief. People should go there, check that out. Check out Wreckers um, channel, American Vindicta. Let's get that out of the way. You also uh, drove through my state, uh, I believe, this last weekend doing a shooting class. Where at Tennessee? Uh, no, so we were we'll be in Tennessee in December. Oh, it's coming soon. Yeah, we just had the last class here in Texas, uh, south gotcha. of the DFW area. So yeah, uh, this upcoming December we're having the the big class. So that'll ah, be fun. Next month, next month. And yeah. where can people find that out? And what's that about? That we get your. So that's at uh, readymaderesources.com. You can sign up. Um, that's going to be a four day class. That's going to involve patrolling, patrolling uh, tactics, nighttime, daytime. Um, operations we're going to be doing uh, a lot of shoot house stuff a lot of scenario based training and some live fire and you know some surprises thrown in there for people too but it, it's uh it's a it's an ass kicking course because they're about you know 12 hour days so you know you mm -hmm. get every bit of the money that you put into this course it's not a pre-madonna course where you know you spend 900 dollars to shoot a pistol for three hours now we're we're training yet to the best of our ability it's fun man it's a lot of fun awesome well, that's good for everyone to check out. And now that you're here, man, um, again, for those for like the details, they can go check that out. But I just as the type of person I am, please tell me they're not using 16 gauge birdshot. Like they're they're doing cut shells or waxers or something, right? 
they're using 16 gauge bird shot. Um, oh. I mean, I, I looked at the rounds and not every round they're doing this to, but some rounds they're cutting it open mm-hmm. and they're melting the projectiles and yeah. putting them back into the shot. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but even then, you know, it's, I was talking with a buddy of mine, all right. He, uh, he's special operations. Uh, we, we were in DHS together and, um, you know, I asked him, I was like, you know, with all the cool, cool guy stuff that you did, if I gave you very questionable high tech equipment and then very questionable high tech armor, and I said, go to this village, by the way, you're not going to have any offensive weapons. And I want you to just start making incursions, scaring people. Mm-hmm. And uh, you're going to get shot with birdshot, probably a lot. What would you do? <laughs> and he's like, I'm not going. Yeah. Because yeah. it's it's the most reasonable thing. Nobody wants to get shot with a shotgun. One of these one of these entities, these beings, these guys, they were shot point blank. And so we're getting so just to, to start back over, what was our goal? All right. So our goal was to go down there and to give as professional of a investigation as possible. Um Timothy Alberino led the entire excursion. He did an awesome job. This was his baby. Mm-hmm. I was there to support him. I did all the filming. I helped him out with uh, a lot of the questioning with the investigations. And, you know, it was uh, it was not what we thought it would be when we got there because, you know, face peelers, right? It's got to be something more than face peelers. Well, what? Sorry, just quickly to interrupt. What were you expecting when you went? If you said it wasn't what, what you thought it would be, what did you expect? So for me, I thought from the beginning that this was related to a people problem. Let's mm-hmm. just say that. I thought humans were heavily invested in this. Some sort of technology that we don't know can't explain. Um, the face peeling, you know, there just wasn't enough to go off of. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we wanted to go down there and give it a proper investigation, get our witness testimonies and evidence and the way that you you do these type of investigations is that you don't want to be biased and leaning towards uh, an opinion. You just want the evidence to produce uh, what it produces naturally. And so, you know, whenever Tim would be questioning people or I'd be helping him with questioning people, you know, it was basically more or less like, hey, OK, what happened to you? And then the, the witness would give us their testimony and we would log it in video evidence. And that was it. You know, we didn't mm-hmm. guide conversations. We would try to have them expound upon information uh, to which uh, occasionally, you know, we got some very unique answers. But for the most part, it was strange how uniform the responses were. Everybody in this village, about 180 people. Uh, and if you if you look up San Antonio de Pitiacu, um from Iquitos, it's westward of Iquitos. About 33 to 35 miles as the crow flies through dense, it's probably the most dense jungle in the world, right? Yeah. It, it is isolated. All up and down that river, these things are happening. Uh, even further up the river, these types of events are happening. Now we're hearing that these events are happening on the other side of Peru. So it's no longer isolated. Uh, when we got there, you know, we expected... Uh, <laughs> You know, I would say we don't really know what to expect. Um, we weren't we weren't naturally leaning on the alien thing, right? Um, and we made that clear. We don't know what it is. We're going there to find out. But very quickly after being there, we discovered a few things. It's most likely not aliens. It's most likely not miners with jetpacks. Uh, it's most likely not cartel. Um, and, you know, from there, what is it? I don't know. And that's the most honest answer is, you know, we, we were only able to spend three days um, in this village. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it costs a ton of money to get this done, by the way. We didn't mm-hmm. sell anything. We didn't make anything. We didn't make a movie. We didn't sell. Like, we went there strictly to find the evidence and then to present it. And we got a lot of hate mail for that. Whatever. Um, but we didn't make our, we didn't enrich ourselves off of any of this. 
so you know going there finding the evidence that we found it's all very uniform it's humanoid figures that are six foot to seven and a half feet tall they're typically on some sort of a black uniform um one or one or two of the witnesses said that you know they shine their light on the guys and they had this silver like uniform riding disc uh these circular disc like platforms that they would stand on that we guess was probably about three feet in circumference mm -hmm. i mean just by the way they always said they naturally stand they weren't lanky um they weren't heavily bulked out so they were just large and so in my mind we're like you know it's like an nba basketball player just a big mm -hmm. dude right um they had the ability to leap and bound over houses leap and bound over these you know 30 40 foot trees very agile um, they were very fast but they they didn't hit anybody with any offensive weapons they weren't you know going in there and you know dismembering people uh, there there's so many things that's odd I'll tell you I'll tell you my mindset about this and then uh, I'll you know let you guys probe me for questions but what's what's interesting about this if if this is a military operation right I, I'm a military guy they did it completely wrong okay if you're going to be using some sort of technology that is stealth and you're operating mainly at night as far as we knew before we got there right operating at night then you have night vision capability all right um, and if the whole goal is to capture a person for either human, uh, trafficking, sex trafficking, or for, you know, taking their freaking faces off, why were you so shitty at it? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. like the, the accounts of, we're talking about like two, seven foot tall guys struggled with a five foot tall, 14 year old, hundred pound Peruvian girl. Talia, mm -hmm. all right. Um, interesting thing to note about Talia, she gave us the best description of these guys. She actually talked about the uniform. She talked about the uh, the body armor that they wore. They had some sort of a triangular um, pattern of metal on their chest, shoulders, I think forearms, legs, like around the thighs. And reminiscent to me, it sounded like motocross gear. Yeah. Mm -hmm right immediately i'm like i i could get on I, I could order what she's talking about right now on amazon it's motocross gear um the helmet the helmet black visor dark helmet dark in color um elongated mm -hmm. uh, a hard case style backpack and we're thinking the backpack because it's not a jet pack we're thinking the, the bat pack is either a small power plant or maybe it's holding batteries Mm -hmm. And that's what that's what's powering them. So on their feet, the most common description, I mean, we got had over 100 men tell us this description, all right, that the bottom of their feet, they have these round discs and that they saw footprints, right? So they could walk and they would glide. Um, why walk when you can glide, right? Mm -hmm. That's strange to me. So then these larger circular platforms, they would step into the platforms like click click talia said that whenever the guy grabbed her because she was out in the back she's picking fruit when the guy grabbed her he like depowered the platform hit the ground grabbed her and then reached down and touched something on the side of his ankle like a button and levitated and then just quickly maneuvered i mean very very agile very fast and by the time she got down towards the chicken coop another one of these guys came and grabbed her feet, and that's when they did all the other stuff. Um, that's when they did the the nasal syringe with narcotics. That's what we're thinking. That's when they did, um, you know, the the stuff with the face, uh, rubbing this white cream on the face. To me, it sounds like um, uh, a very high powered lidocaine, maybe numbing cream. That, yeah, yeah the, and it also opened up the capillaries of the face. Mm -hmm. She said that her face instantly started to swell. So it's bringing all the blood to the surface. Mm -hmm. So why do you need that? Um, immediately, I started thinking about um, the thing that Sandra Bullock said a long time ago about how she was doing the uh, the blood treatment on her mm -hmm. face. 
So, you know, I don't know why you need a face. If we want to go deep into this, maybe there's like an eyes wide shut party and you're only invited if you have like your own, bring your own face, right? Mm. But then why um, leave them alive? Like life is cheap. I, life is cheap, I don't, right? You know, when they when they went to uh, kidnap Talia, or Talia, um, she was fighting and struggling. Mm -hmm. One of the guys' open hand smacks her to the ground. It's and this human. is her, very human-like. This is, and by the way, this is her testimony, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and we just have to take it on face value for what it is. Um, she gets knocked to the ground, dropped, whatever, and... I think I think the most interesting part about this is when they started to speak in Spanish uh, and she noticed two different accents. She said a gringo and then a Peruvian. So the the Peruvian Spanish, that jungle dialect that they were speaking mm -hmm. is very different compared to regular Spanish. Uh, and Doug speaks no Spanish. So while I'm there, like I have I'm the butt end of all jokes. I have no idea what's being said around me and I cannot understand what anyone is saying when we're interviewing them so um i guess the thing that freaked uh talia out is that the two guys that kidnapped her we reminded her so much of them mm -hmm. because of our stature and if you look at the the pictures and videos of us we're giants out there these people yeah. are like five feet tall Right. These people are like five feet tall. Um, and I'm easily like two and a half times the size of the average guy in that village. So, you know, I can see how they from human appearances. You know, if you talk about uh, the nature of psychology at night, the, the blood's up, uh, mm -hmm. the blood pressure's up, the adrenaline's dumped. And they're seeing these guys levitating on these discs. They look gigantic to them, All right? Um, if if I had the ability to do a little bit longer investigation, um, I would continue to to ask these guys questions and and just try to do as much memory recall as possible. That's one of the things I learned as a a use of force instructor is to always try and get as much memory recall out of our officers after an incident. Because, you know, that first 72 hours, things are kind of foggy. You're, you're looking at everything through tunnel vision and you're trying to recall everything that's going on around you. Well, same thing with these witnesses and their testimonies. If we had more time with Talia, uh, we probably could have pulled a lot more stuff out of there. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know at the same time because of how dramatic everything was. I don't know what she fabricated in her mind. Because mm -hmm. there's going to be that. You have to account for that. Um, but her brother saw them. Uh, at least five to eight men of that village. I mean, like, like, if this is where the incident happened, there's a circle of houses with guys with shotguns. And so, like, if it's one of you two guys, right? It's two of you guys. You're going to kidnap some girl in the middle of, the, of this little village with guys surrounding you with shotguns. And you don't have any weapons. You guys feel comfortable doing that? Who wants to take the first slug to the hip? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, and interesting to note that when these um, when these guys were being shot or shot at, they never heard anything verbal. No verbal commands. They never heard them talking on the radios. They never heard like a ah, I've been shot. Nothing. Dead quiet. Um, and, and even with, you know, really quiet radio operations, you would still hear murmuring, mm -hmm. uh, but nothing. Only Talia is the one who who'd identified any type of, uh, of conversations. And we don't know if that, you know, happened in her head. Um, there's some people who, who are speculating maybe it was uh, telepathic. I don't know. We're not there for that. We're there just to gather the evidence. And then, you know, see what the evidence produces. Um, but I can tell you this much. Those people are scared to death. They burnt down over five acres worth of jungle. We walked it. And, you know, we're like, wow. You And we're with the Apu. 
uh, high road. And we're like, you burnt all this down? And they said, we had to because the the primary jungle was right on the the you know the back porches of everybody Mm -hmm. um, in this village and that's where these things would just appear and so they they cleared out easily a hundred meters outward and then five acres and a crescent Hmm. so that they had better line of sight you know and 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 tim and i we had rolled around a few things while we're there we're like you know, because the three days we were there, we didn't see anything, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we didn't think we would see anything. But the three days we're there, we're getting so much witness testimony. I mean, people were lining up to talk to us. And we're like, are these people, like, are they screwing with us? Like, are they are they feeding us what we want to hear because we're, we're bringing them aid? Because yeah. we brought them, you know, food and medicine. Um I'm not going to say they could have cared less about it, but they unloaded the boat for the supplies that we got them. They put it in the, in the main government house. We took a a cool picture with it and then it went to their storehouse and never heard about that ever again. Hmm. And these guys went back to patrolling and asking us questions. And we're asking them questions like, you know, these guys were freaked out, totally freaked out. It seems a bit the whole time. Beyond, it seems a bit beyond the pale as well that um, these people would come out with with a story like this just on the off chance some people happen to bring them stuff. Yeah, and, and once again, people who are who are naysaying about this, we had to charter a boat, and we had to go two and a half days up the Amazon River. That is not a straight path. I mean, it snakes the whole way like this. I mean, it, we were going maybe like five knots the entire, the entire time. Mm-hmm. We weren't going more than 10 miles an hour, probably ever. And so it took forever to get there. And then we stayed all day and all night in that village. No one ever asked us for money. Mm-hmm. Um, they didn't ask us for extra stuff. They, you know, they were generally, uh, genuinely, they were like, why are you helping us? And so we just told him, well, for one thing, we're Christians and we feel God's called us here to help you. And two, you guys do need help. So we believe something is going on mm-hmm. and uh, we're, we're here to help you. And, you know, maybe we helped them. Maybe we didn't. We gave them night vision uh, and it's cheap night vision, guys. We can't give them you know, the stuff our yeah. military has because that's an ITAR uh, classified piece of equipment. It can't leave the country. Um, so, you know, we gave them stuff that we you know, got off of Amazon, they're about $300 a piece. Uh, they work really good and they can record on them. So hopefully they re- get to record something. Um, I gave them a uh, high road, the, the Apu, the chief, I gave him my FLIR scout. That's like a $700 you know, piece of equipment. Yeah. You know, we gave them a uh, high powered Baofeng radios. We gave them these $300 high power, uh, O lights. Um, so, you know, we, we dropped probably about three grand worth on them. And we didn't tell them we were bringing that. Mm-hmm. We, we brought that literally for their safety and success and protecting them. Because, man, coming out there, um, we had heard multiple stories once meeting the villagers that, you know, they had accidentally shot themselves. And when you go out there and you see, it's like working with the Iraqis again. When you see these guys carrying guns like purses, mm-hmm. you know, a, a barrel is always pointed either at your groin, your torso, or your face at some point in time during the day. And so, you know, we, we had to, we had to always be cognizant of that. We asked everyone to take rounds out of all chambers while we were there. Um, and then we gave them proper, you know, instruction on how to use those guns so that no one else would get hurt. So that they would be more successful in protecting the village. How long Um, did you train them for? Just one night. We only had time for one night, but it was a consistent thing. And, you know, all we did, and we had a guy out there who's, uh, I think he's the head instructor for the Peruvian uh, jungle survival class. Mm-hmm. Great guy. Me and him just went over some basic infantry tactics. Here's a column patrol. Walk around like this. And if anything happens, you guys just get online and then address it. Don't fire until you're told to fire. Because before that, you know, they were ants on a frying pan. They were just moving all around the place. And you could see 
that these guys, they were not afraid for one thing at all. I thought this was a very interesting uh, point is that when these creatures or whatever would come into um, the outskirts of, of the, uh, the village, the men would see them and then they would all get online, run towards them and start shooting at them. And, uh, and then the, these creatures would just flee oddly human thing, right? Oddly human thing. Um, which doesn't make sense. Why are you doing a cat and mouse game? If you are, if you are human, why are you risking having a mini artillery strike with 16 gauge shotguns pointed at you? I like, you know, 30 or 40 shotguns firing in one direction. That's, that's dangerous, right? You know what it kind of sounds like? It sounds like a guided trophy hunt. Like people who go for bears with bows. I was going to say. So I have considered this. Uh, Al Barino and I talked about this. You know, with Epstein Island, mm. they were hunting kids out there. Yeah. There's a place in the Dominican Republic that we're aware of where similar actions are going on. And so, you know, I talked about these eyes wide shut style parties. Well, that's the people who go there. Once you have enough money to buy an island, mm -hmm. what don't you have enough money to buy? Mm. Uh, the boat that we chartered, good group of guys, right? Um, they're all it, the boat's owned by a bunch of doctors, and um, they go, you know, way up into the Amazon, and they take take people on these scientific expeditions, and they have their own little piece of the forest, like fifty acres or whatever, um, that they I guess they purchased. And so it's a scientific observatory and you can go there and, you know, just observe the wildlife. Well, if eight guys who are just, you know, retired doctors and whatever from America can buy 50 acres that takes almost two weeks to get to up the Amazon river guys. And I'm telling you two days up the Amazon river, nobody's coming for you. Nobody's coming to rescue you. Like if, if anything happens to you, you have to haul ass back to Aikido's. It, there's really, I mean, you're probably not going to have a place for a helicopter to reach you, let alone no one has, I think, the ability to reach a helicopter out there. So you have to take a pecky pecky, which is a little outboard boat, and you have to haul butt all the way back to Aikido's, which is about a six to seven hour trip. Um, now you keep going down the river. I mean, no one's coming for you. So if these guys can be two weeks deep in the Amazon so for some scientific observation, what can a billionaire do? If part of the Amazon rainforest is for sale, what can't they buy? And, you know, I went back and forth with the cartel a lot. And I didn't know if uh, the cartel was involved. It seemed like there's a possibility just because of the area that we're in. But, you know, the Mexican cartel, they have equipment that is supposed to be American special forces equipment only, but yet they've got it. So where are they getting that from? And if, if the Mexican cartel can get it, then who can't get it? Um, so, you know, we don't, we don't have any good answers. Um, it warrants more investigations and more time of which we just didn't have the time for. So, you know, uh, I think some people are disappointed we didn't come back and say, oh, it's aliens. Um, we don't know what it is, but most likely I believe it's people. It's very insidious. It's very nefarious. Um, they are preying upon people. They, they have some sort of equipment that is a next gen that we don't have. And uh, it's not an isolated incident. They're not trying to scare these people off of their land. Uh, this was happening in Nalta, which Nalta is a city of over 30,000 people with the military there. So this was going on there. Um, so I don't, I don't know how to explain further of what we saw and what we experienced. You know, um, do you think this? Do you think they are based nearby there, or do you think they are going there, whatever they are? Because I, I know. Um, and I, I, you guys got that 
information or from the the villagers drawing the craft that's that kind of like see-through um from the bottom craft that you they could see two of these uh guys piloting it do, do you think that they, they are coming there or do you think do you reckon they are based there i have no idea no but idea. They, but they are drawing them. But, but how many? How many of them drew? Described that craft? Was it three or, or two or three of them? At least two or three of them. You know, um, for the most part, the, what everyone saw was these guys on individual discs, or it'd be two guys on a large disc um, that's more than ten foot in diameter. So, um, it's the the UFO part is really an anomaly. Because that's the one thing that is really the outlier with many of our witness testimonies. Um, where are they at? Where they're from? Where are they going? I don't know. If it's human operated and it, it has to have batteries, well, mm -hmm. batteries have to be charged by bigger batteries. So they have to go somewhere. I don't know how long uh, a conventional battery source that they're using could last. That's the thing. It's like until we get more evidence or until someone from Lockheed speaks up about it right um it's all conjecture and there's so much room for interpretation that it just muddies the water yeah and then it becomes this big what if game and then you know you can make up whatever you want to make up um the the, the biggest thing that i could tell you is that whatever's happening is real uh we we interviewed the girl who was kidnapped or the attempted kidnapping we saw the scars the scars to me it appeared to look like burn marks from, you know, like, like a heated scalpel uh, that veterinarians use or mm -hmm. doctors use during surgeries. Um, because I, I had a cattle mutilation that was on our back pasture, and it looked like the same type of scarification that we saw that was on one of our steers. So I don't, when you, when you, when you just take a step back from the 30,000 foot view, still nothing makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so, in a lot of ways, I think that it adds more validity to the case. It's still unexplainable. It's like Skinwalker Ranch. It's still unexplainable. If we went there and we were easily able to explain it away, sure. But there's some interesting things to note. Skinwalker Ranch. One of the guys uh, that owned Skinwalker Ranch, his wife was there alone one time. And she said that this large ship lands mm -hmm. out in the back pasture and what she called Darth, Fi Darth Vader like figure walks out all black, seven foot tall, big footprints. Sounds like our guys out in the jungle. All right. And then there's another case that's in Europe um, where a family was harassed for well over a year by these seven foot tall entities that were in all black large footprints and they could hover and they could fly so we're starting to see a common theme here and you know how many different cases can you go back in ufology um and that the one that i'm talking about is from the book uninvited mm -hmm. um so how many cases like that are out there where you have these very large imposing figures that seem to be you know, wearing dark clothing, um, and they're harassing people. And it's chaotic. It's it's all over the place. It's never the same type of uh, attacks on these people. While we're out there, we didn't experience anything uh, paranormal or poltergeist. We asked about it. They said there was nothing like that. There was no uh, problems with the, the power supply that was there from the generator. None of that. It's just these guys on this, they'd fly in. Uh, they'd scare the shit out of everybody. They'd all shoot at them and then they'd flee. It doesn't make sense. It have makes you, zero sense. Have you ever heard of the Kelly Hopkinsville encounter in 1955 in Western Kentucky? Uh, I'll break it down. A small family farm encounters that they believe to be glowing lights that turn into creatures. They break out shotguns and rifles, get out in a shootout with these things. They're dropping them, knocking them down. They get back up. And they charge yep. them. Family sits inside. There's a standoff. They go away. There's like physical yep. evidence on the ground. People are like, you're insane. Like, look at these footprints. Other people from around saw it. What's going on? Now, Kentucky actually has a, they called them hobgoblins, but like the reports that people gave were different. They had big heads. They wore what looked like a suit. 
some people were like, they were like child size, but some of the adults were like, no, they were huge. They were, you know, a foot taller than us. It's, it's very interesting. Some of those yeah. little valleys and stuff in uh, Eastern Kentucky, I know they have the hobgoblin myths and things like that. And it's a very similar thing. People, mm-hmm. you know, that's, there's a reason people don't go out in the haulers at night. <laughs> yeah. I've, this, this kind of, no, kind of goes with, um, the, well, f- for me anyway, the idea of what you were saying before about this maybe being some sort of like hunting thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, are you, you aware of a film called um, Monsters of Men? Mm-mm. At all. It was a film that came out in 2000. I'll, I'll bring this picture up here of the, the, the robot that's in said film. Um, oh, you shared this with me earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's the robot that's in, in this film. The, oh, the I know. Plot, yeah, I've seen this one. Yeah. The plot of this film is there is a, um, I'll read the IMDb thing for a moment. Uh, a U.S. weapons manufacturer tests four killer robots on heroin producers uh, in the Golden Triangle. Um, the there's even a scene in this film where one of the robots re- like peels a person's face off, and yeah. um, the <laughs> it's I'm 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 not saying that the people have seen this and have, and have made a story up through through this, but the idea that there could be some sort of if you if if you talk about talking about um, people using this as some sort of sport, the idea that the st- stories of that could drift down and then seep into films, you know, and mm-hmm. all of a sudden art imitates life. If you believe anything about the stuff they say about Hollywood, maybe somebody's taking this uh, train yeah, ride before somewhere else, and they're like, "Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, that would make a good movie." Remember that trip we took to Cambodia? Mm. Um, I don't. I mean. It's very weird, man. And I believe I was listening to Tim say that uh, this phenomenon isn't like an age-old story. It's like a 40-year-old story. Right? It's 50 years old. 50 yeah. years old. Originally, the Pedacalas flew in on uh, paragliders. Really? So, mm. wow. you know, I, it, just to think about that seems kind of silly to me. But here's another correlation is that they were flying. Yeah. Okay, so they, they are airborne. Um. We have no idea why they picked this this little jungle village. It's the oldest village that's in the for the Akito people uh, that's along this river. Uh, this village is at least uh, 200, 300 years old. Um, and so is the bloodline. Maybe there's something to do with the bloodline. Um, but other than that, it, it just doesn't make any sense. So something just know. dawned on me, you know, like in Canada. If you go moose or elk hunting, they have those little islands where they have uninterrupted trophy animals mm-hmm. that are, apparently they taste different too. Yeah. Unspoiled. Uh, yeah. Unspoiled. Yeah. Uh, guys, I'm fixing that to, uh, to get off here. Um, so I can't stay on for very much longer, but nice. I'd love to come back on and uh, try and have a, an update for you guys. Yeah, man. Uh, or, or just do uh chit chat. You're interesting, mm-hmm. dude. Yeah, man. Hey, guys, appreciate it. Thank you very much for letting me. Uh, just quickly, just here. before just before you go, did anything happen with? Um, I saw a tweet from uh, Timothy Arborino uh, replying to a video that somebody had put on um, Twitter with s- someone that that had like lacerations on his face, and the person the boy. Put on Twitter oh, the yeah, boy, was yeah. trying to say it was yeah. it was from Peru. Has there been any update on that about whether that was a legitimate video from the area or something? No, we don't know. The uh, when we were in Nalta, we were told of a, a boy um, who was attacked a uh, similar way as uh, Talia, and he was cut from above the ear all the way down to the chin. Apparently, it was very gruesome, very bloody. Yeah. Um, there's just no explanation for it. Law enforcement doesn't have an explanation for it. The Peruvian government doesn't have an explanation for it, nor are they are they looking into it. Mm-hmm. So these people are truly left to their own devices um no one's going to come and interrupt what they're doing and likewise no one's going to come and protect these villagers either so you know um yeah man the uh the mystery continues Hmm. if you want to do say if you want to do something like that to people you do it to people that people aren't going to care about you know in the same way as you 
if if you're going to tr- steal and traffic children, you do it out of impoverished and third world countries. Yeah, well, I mean, if you were going to abduct somebody uh, for human trafficking, why mm-hmm. not just go to the bars and wait for them to get drunk? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. I'm not. I'm not saying this is anything yeah. to do with with human trafficking. Well, that's, it's just that's what yeah. we thought. That's mm-hmm. that's original because we we have to we have to look at the full spectrum of what could be going on, and why would you go through so much trouble to mm-hmm. go so far deep into the jungle that if anything bad were to happen to your aircraft? You're landing on top of the worst, most dangerous jungle in the world, you know, and and no one's coming for you either. Mm. Um, so none of it makes sense. Um, you know, this is the the first real investigation to go on. Uh, hopefully, it won't be the last. Hopefully, uh, the guys at uh, San Antonio de Pitayaku um, can better protect themselves now, uh, since they are much more equipped. And what we're hoping is that they catch one of them. That's what we're hoping is that they, if it is people, we hope that they catch them and we hope it's exposed. And then the truth can be told to the world until then it's a, it's anybody's game. So hmm. guys, thanks. Thanks very much for letting me come Hello, on. Mom. No, thanks. thanks for coming man. On. Yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks. Cheers, buddy. So, bye bye. That was interesting. So interesting. It only gets weirder. 